So, um, look, I'm, I'm on it. I don't know if Phoebe can speak for herself, but it, it is an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, and with you guys especially. We're going to share tonight. It's not all about us getting down and telling you about all the wonderful things we've done. It's not, it will not be about that. It's got a lot about a lot of other things instead. Um, we're going to take you on a journey of discovery within yourselves. And we're going to show you what we did and talk about what we did and talk about the ancients and our connection and, and how we've been able to try and piece all of this together because it's, it's quite a story. Okay, so uh, where to begin, my goodness me. I would say that this is a culmination really of a lifetime of experiences. And what I'm interested in and with you guys is really what brings you here as well. Where are your interests? What's firing you guys up? Because there's a whole lot of people out there that don't know anything about this and have not even a clue, not even an interest. So, you know, think about what it is that brings you here tonight as well. That's a part of that. For me, I grew up in New Zealand and right throughout my childhood, my great grandfather helped to bring me up and he would take me to the ancient sites. And we would sit amongst these beautiful places, these fortresses, these, these areas that people had lived in. And they weren't living there anymore, but I was fascinated by the fact that people had lived here before the Europeans. And he was great with his history. So he set the, the, the ball rolling, if you like, and we would, even in his 80s, we would climb incredible cliffs to go up and sit. And he would tell me the history of the people that had lived there before. And then throughout the, the beginnings of my life, around about 17, I had an encounter with a Maori healer who just blew my gates open wide. Um, I'd gone to see him, I wasn't feeling particularly good. He put his hands on me, next minute I'm floating above the table looking at my body. And I had to go and see him. Afterwards I said to him, what did you do? I said, because you just changed everything, you know what happened? And he said, that's how I work. He said, I take people out of their bodies and work with them and I bring them back in. My family's done it for generations. And, um, and then he looked at me and he said one thing. He said, you would be very good at this work if you ever decided to do it. So I tried everything. I had 28 jobs in two years. I was a laborer, a brickie, a painter, a, a barman, a waiter, a God knows what, a chef, all sorts of things. <laughs> Nothing worked. I'd get fired or I'd leave until I took up healing and, um, and I remembered what that old man had said and uh, that opened the doors to, to our connection and our meeting and our coming together and our healing journey because we are healers, we've been in the, in the field for 30 years full time now. Um, so that was a part of, uh, there's a series of visions that I just couldn't ignore that, that was so strong. Uh, <laughs> I was in, a, in the kitchen at my home and a, a Maori man appeared in, in, in full. Uh, no, he wasn't. He was in European dress, but he was mending this net. And I was looking at him, thinking, "What are you doing in my kitchen? Well, who are you? What is going on?" And the logical mind kicked him. Thought, "This is crazy. What is happening?" And he would. He was just beckoning to me, and I could see him on the shores of this place in the North Island of New Zealand. And he was fixing these nets up. And he just kept doing this and he disappeared and then a few days later he did the same thing again turned up in the same place and beckoning to me again and the third time I asked him I said who are you and he told me his name and I said and where are you and he told me where he was and so I said to Phoebe we were in Adelaide at the time I've got to go and meet this man I don't know who he is I don't know what it's about but I do know that I have to go and I did put it on the credit card, had absolutely no money and <laughs> luckily I've got a trusting wife in that way. She said, look honey, just do what you need to do. And to cut a long story short, it is in our books and there's two now and there's a third one coming. But I borrowed my grandfather's car, drove all the way around the east coast and eventually ended up at, uh, with a, a Maori who was a carver. I spent three days with him and he taught me about how the art of carving had been given to the people via the gods, via the ancestors, and how their style in this area had come from there. And I looked at, he looked at me and he said, you're a carver. And I said, I've never carved anything in my life. 
He said, you will. He said, what you're wearing around your neck and what I was at that time was a green stone carving tool. He said, you will carve. And the next night I went high up into a mountain. I knew that this was part of the journey and went up to a place called Mount Hikorangi. Hikorangi is the first place pretty much in the world to see the rising sun. And I remember fully coming through the supermarket because I had to get a few little things, some water and a little bit of food before I went up into the mountain. I decided to stay the night up there. And I came out of the supermarket and as I walked through into this little area coming out actually of the main door, there was an old Maori man sitting on the side there looking at me. And he said, you go straight down that road and you turn left. And I said, what? I said, I'm going to Mount Hikarangi. He said, yeah, and that's how you get there. <laughs> so what do you do? You follow, you follow your visions. And I did, and I was, to cut a lot, again, cut a long story short, was guided to get to the top of the mountain, spent the night there. Um, huge amount of energy came through, massive, incredible experience. And came back and started carving. I started carving bone and practicing and working on it. People would have these carvings and they wouldn't want to take them off. There's something that came through the carvings themselves. That I've been developing my skills now for over you know, 20 years in that field. A second vision was to go and get the green stone from New Zealand. And I had to go around a whole lot of different elders. No guidance, just the wisdom of the inner journey and met with some elders, managed to get some beautiful stone that sat with me for three years. Now, prior to that, there had been another event in Mexico, in Palenque, and that, I believe, was the... See, it's hard in, in this time frame to work out what came first, you know, like the chicken or the egg. There was all of this preparation, all of this lining up, and then there was a particular night in Palenque. Phoebe wasn't there that particular time. So what happened was I, I, I was traveling with, has anyone heard of Barbara Massignac? And Bringers of the Dawn, the Pleiades. So we got to know Barbara very early in the piece. And when we heard some of her, her uh, tapes, something, something happened. And I still don't know what it was, but we managed to connect with her. And she's really hard to connect to. Um, and I think it was the day or so before we were about to leave to meet with Barbara initially that her friend said, oh, we've got a letter from some people from Australia um, and, you know, they want to meet you. And Barbara's like, I don't care, you know, do what you want. <laughs> and so Marsha got on, the, a friend of ours got on the phone and said, you know, come and meet us. And she set it up and stayed at her place. And that was the beginning of an opening of consciousness that was quite huge, you know, sitting in with the, with the channelings and the experiences that we had at that point. You know how you have teachers that come and go, you know, when it's time to move on from one teacher, move to another teacher. And it was just grabbing the target by the tail. We were off and we brought her out to Australia and we did uh, Uluru and went through all the sacred science through there. Um, but this particular time, Phoebe wasn't with me. And we had been to the, a lot of the pyramids in Palenque and had an amazing time. We traveled all around the place and had the channelings. And I wanted some time to myself, so I went down to part of the hotel and just sat on the grass for a moment or two. Then got up and went to my go to my room and everything slowed down. Everything went into really, really slow time, slow motion. And it was like I was I don't know what was going on, but it was a very strange experience. And being the curious sort of person I am, I thought that I'd see if I could try and do it again the next night. And went back out, sat in the same place, looking up at the stars, and the next minute I passed out on the ground, just flat. I don't know what, well, I, I kind of know what happened now, but at the time I had no clue. Um, woke up, looked up in the sky and this light just shot across the sky and just disappeared across the horizon. It was just the most phenomenal thing I've ever felt. My body shook for about three hours afterwards and for a long time. It, it's, it still takes me a lot to, to work out what that experience was all about. I believe at that point Okay, guys. <laughs> I believe at that point that a lot of symbols were laid down, a lot of locations were laid down that I was taken to certain places. 
to experience certain things. Um, basically, the future was mapped out as to where we would go, what we would do, uh, and the coming together of Phoebe and myself as a partnership uh, was a very important, very pivotal part of that. There was a point where I decided we hadn't met. That was right at the beginning in the gym. Um, and I decided I was going to LA to train because I was right into my bodybuilding, so it was all physical. He's gone back in time now. Yeah, we do. We loop around a bit. Um, but the universe stopped me. I was thrown off my bike and couldn't go. I had everything set to go. It was totally into the physical form and boom. We met three weeks later and that's when our partnership began. We did, as I said, have a garden of Eden here. Absolutely beautiful garden of Eden. We had everything everything that we needed and then if you look at the bible somebody ate from the tree of knowledge somebody found something out somebody started to wake up and that wasn't okay we're punished for that so our, you know a lot of our dna was shut down a lot of our information was shut down and we got hacked as a species and that's what's happening now we're beginning to remember that we're beginning to go hey maybe there's more out there what is up in the stars? Who are our ancestors? Where are the common links through the ancient cultures? Because they hold the knowledge. That's why there's been subsequent trashing of their people, desecration of their sites. That's why you know religion has come straight over the top of them and shut them down. And they've been degraded. And yet still within that, there's the, the thread of knowledge is there. And that's where we go back to. Because those guys have the answers. So each symbol, there was one at a time. Um, they're in sequence now, which is good. What would happen was, remember I said to you that I had to go to the elders. I was given some green stone, some very sacred stone. I knew I had to carve it at some point, And it scared the heck out of me. The stone had immense power. But I would get a symbol and it would just keep coming, 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 coming. And so this was the first one. This one here called Dawn. Um... The interesting thing about that was that a friend of ours, Barry Brailsford, that I mentioned, that wrote, wrote Song of Waitaha. Uh, if you're interested in New Zealand history, have a look, because it's incredible. It's all their history written down. It was covered up and hidden for a long time. He had a book launch on, and Barry knew we were coming, and I took the stone to him, because what had happened was that on the journey that I went to collect the stone was the first time that I met Barry, and that was... How many years ago? Huh? Probably 20 something anyway. 28. He blessed the stone. Um, there was another Maori shaman that blessed the stone who was in Wellington. And I spoke to her and I said, I'm heading down to, to pick some stone up. She said, you call me when you get back. This woman travels all over the world. She goes and teaches in Holland, all through Europe. She's a very, very well known woman. And I said to her, I rang her, as I promised, I said, I'm back and I've got the stone. And she said, right, and she said, I'll come and see you. She got to see me and she looked at me shaking her head and she said, what is going on? And she said, I don't come and see anybody ever. They come and see me. I don't. She said, I've caught to a bus, a train and a taxi to come and see you. <laughs> what the heck is happening? Then she looked at the stone. She went, yeah, got it. And so she blessed that stone. The next part of that journey was to go to a place called Parihaka. And Parihaka in New Zealand, there was a, a brief program on it on uh, NITV uh, last Tuesday. I don't know if anyone caught it, but it, when I talk about Waitaha, the Waitaha people were the people of peace. <coughs> they refused to fight. They met in Easter Island, they came from Easter Island and they had the waka, the great canoes, and they traveled all the way across to New Zealand. They settled in New Zealand, many of them. And they went for the stone. Their wise men sent their minds out and they knew that the green stone, the Potanamu, this one here, was in the land. It's the stone of the gods, it's the stone of peace, it's the stone of healing. And they knew it was there and they went to find it. And when they found it, they settled there. And what Barry, Barry being an archaeologist, was so confused because there was no fortification in any of these places in the South Island. None, there was just nothing. And the Māori had, you know, the big palisades and the pars and they were, they were warriors. So he's going, well, what's going on here? Because, these, you know, there's, 
nothing to defend these people at all. Uh, little did he know that he would be actually asked to write their story and it was all down in song. And when he went to write it, they said, do you want the 24 hour version or the seven day song? <laughs> right, so this it was all passed on through the women because a lot of the men were killed. So the women passed their story on to their daughters and it went on down the line. They didn't fight. But if you read Song of Waitaha, you'll see that they bowed their heads to the club and they don't all die holding hands. They kept their knowledge and they died with dignity, but they would not fight. We're not a warlike people. We've been taught to be warlike. It's not in our, in our nature to be that way. We've been educated and coerced and conned into fighting. We're still doing it. Although people are waking up a bit more. So the history and the legacy of Parihaka was that, um, well to start with, remember I said to you that we're going to go around in circles because that's how we talk, is that okay? We're going to end, <laughs> stay with me for a sec. Um, it's just the old way of teaching. The journey with the, with the net, with the old man, when I went to see him and I spent time on that mountain, was the beginning. And two or three years later, I saw a vision of a woman standing in front of a mountain in full dress, traditional dress, and she looked at me and she was going, come over. And I was in Lennox Head down and just down the coast at the time, and I said, no, nah, I'm not doing this again. I'm not doing it. And so she disappeared. And then she turned up again. I had another vision of her standing in my kitchen as clear as like I would be with you, just right there. And she said, and I went up. And then she turned up again, a third time. And she said, come over. And I went, and she said, I won't call you again. And she just turned her back and she was gone, disappeared. I knew I had to go. I knew it was really important, didn't know what it was about. That mountain that that woman was standing in front of, front of was Mount Taranaki. At the base of Mount Taranaki, this is in the North Island near New Plymouth, if anyone knows New Zealand. And I didn't know this at the time, but there's a very sacred place there. And it was a place called Parihaka. Parihaka was a, a place of peaceful resistance way before Gandhi and way before Martin Luther King. This was the origin of peaceful resistance. And they knew that Maori and, and the Waitaha people knew that they couldn't fight anymore. They couldn't resist the colonial invasion. They just couldn't do it. So they held their ground, they kept their land, and they said, we're going to sit here and we're going to hold on to it. And we'll offer no resistance other than that. And so the people would come in, they'd confiscate the land, the people would take the fences down and they would plow the fields and they'd plant vegetables. And then the soldiers would come in, they'd dig it up and they'd arrest the people. And then the next lot would come in and they'd plow it and they'd plant their vegetables and they were arrested and then the next lot would come. And then when the people were released from prison, they came back and they did the same thing and they went over and over and over again. Until one day, when the cavalry decided that they had enough. And so what they did is they, they came and I've walked this road and I didn't know what that energy was that I felt when walking down this place. I didn't know what it was. Didn't even know why I was there. But what had happened was the cavalry had come through and what they did is that they put all the young children right in the very front of the horses with flowers. And then they put their women and their old women first, then their women, then their old men, and then their middle-aged men and then and the sick people and then right at the back were the warriors, the strong men of the village. And they just stood in the way of the cavalry and the cavalry pushed their way through. And they said to them, tomorrow, if you haven't gone, we'll kill every last one of you. That's it. It's a big story and something that hasn't been told that often. So what happened then was that the cavalry went up the hill, and there's a big hill that overlooks the village, and the people sat in the square all together watching. Cavalry came up, the guns came up, they pointed the guns at the people, and they said, move or we'll kill you. And they went, no. We're not moving. Then something amazing happened. Because out of the back of one of those huts came a dog. And that dog went all the way through the people. This is recorded history. There's photos of the dog. It came all the way up past everybody, went all the way up, up the hill past the soldiers, 
lifted his leg on the cannon, peed on the cannon, and that was it. Everybody cracked up laughing, the whole thing finished. Couldn't do it. They arrested the, the ringleaders, they were taken to prison, but that place is still there, the people still live there. And passive resistance won out. So Gandhi, Martin Luther King, all those guys went to this area to, you know, to honor what had happened in that place. Um, and the stone went there, and it was blessed there. And then it went on to Barry, and Barry Brailsford did the same. He blessed it and opened the circle. 20 years later, or 20-something years later, he was there to close the circle in 2012 when we finished <laughs> our journeys around the world, which took us eight years. They went to Mount Kailash. Yeah. Does anyone know Mount Kailash or know of it? It's the holy mountain of, of Tibet. Yeah. yeah, far western Tibet, very isolated place. And um, a heck of a journey. I actually died and came back on that one. Literally, I had yeah. pulmonary edema. Um, and, and cerebral edema. Yeah. I will say, guys, that, um, and, and you know, take this as you will, but when you walk your path, you walk your path. There is no coming back. So it was about three days in, I got very, very sick. I was breathing water, not air. Um, I was drowning, basically. And the guide said to me then, he said, mate, you've got to make a decision. You need to go down, or at least decide what you're going to do, because it's your choice. Um, and I looked at him and I said, no, we're going to the light. And the sun was coming up in that direction we were headed. And it was cloudy down the other way where we'd just be, and I went up. Alan was asking me before, we're talking about Masaru and Moto's work. You, everyone familiar or most people familiar? Anybody not? So I can fill them in. Um, Hidden Messages of Water. He was the Japanese professor that discovered the consciousness of water. Uh, so what he used to do was um, he, would, he would say prayers into water and then he would freeze the crystals and then use an electron microscope to see the shifts of, of his mind into the water and what it did. Incredible results. He passed away a little while ago, but um, because we're 85% water, it, all of our thoughts are affecting our body all the time, so it's, it's good to, to remember that. So he would send love into the crystals and you'd have amazing mandalas, and he would send negative thoughts in and they would just be the most horrendous <laughs> things. You wouldn't want to put it in your body for sure. So um, getting back to what Alan was saying, uh, the Scientifically, the closest thing I can say to you is that the Ponamu, the green stone, is a water stone. And it's a stone of healing, it's a stone of great power. It was carved with intent, so every time one of those symbols was carved, or even um, worked on or taken out, it was prayed on. I prayed, I smoked it, the intent was there, it was polished, then it was wrapped, and it was layer upon layer upon layer of prayer. Then when it was finished, it was passed to Phoebe. It was wrapped in flax. And women are the keepers of the ponam, the green stone. They're the carriers of the stone. So until we got to the, to the sacred area, she held on to it and looked after it. When something like that, with that sort of magnitude and that sort of power goes into water, it carries that message. Right? So that intent and that love are in huge bodies of sacred water now. And they stay there and they keep feeding the earth, feeding the land. There is one language that they all speak, and it's the language of the heart and the respect. And when you have that connection, you can connect with God, because they read you, they know exactly who you are, they see your energy, they see what you bring with you. Okay, now because we know you're just as way out and wacky as we are, um, when we say ancestors, we're actually talking about our ancestors from off world when we mention them. So, um, so it's not just our ancestors from England or wherever they are, our off-world ancestors. We totally, absolutely believe we all are related to off-world uh, off beings. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so if we say ancestors, that's what we're relating to. They walk amongst us always. So the off-world, um, the ancestors that uh, we also talk about are the ones who were here before you had to have a physical body to be in 3D reality. Okay, so that's why they can walk amongst us and every now and then we'll see them and they'll come and talk to us. As you were saying, you saw one in a theatre. 
um, and they will come and talk to you. They call all of us to come and do something, to step up. Um, everybody is called, but not everybody answers the calling. And, and so we did. So we can talk a little bit more about their connections to uh, which planets they, they feel they're connected to. Um, as you talk about the, um, the Australian Aborigines, of course, we believe they're connected to the Pleiadians, and it's everywhere. We go out into the desert, we take people out into the desert with us, and we go to countries that uh, the tourists don't go to. All right, thank you. <laughs> there was the big one, um, and I think that planted the seeds for the rest of my future, but there were things that happened along the way prior to. My, um, if we're getting into, into past lives and, and um, experiences, I have memories, distinct memories, of, of working and walking this planet over and over again. Most of it was solo. Phoebe and I have been together a lot. But I always worked in the shamanic realms and I worked very undercover. Um, this is why, as I said, I don't talk about this very often. But I know my job. I know my job is to bring light onto the planet. And I knew that very, very early. My job is to wake people up, help the consciousness rise, step up. So all of those journeys, um, and as part of my work and Phoebe's work, all of those journeys were opening portals of light. They were keys. These were not sacred sites like, oh, we'll go to Machu Picchu or we'll go to Peru or, you know, to, um, uh, to Giza, even though we went to Giza. These were well-hidden places, well-guarded places, places very remote that only these people knew about. They were places that were well-guarded and well-protected and they'd been shut down. And I had the key. I had the key. And the key was from the heart. It was what we call koha. It was a gift to the earth. It was the green stone that opened those doors that allowed that light to, to open portals right across the planet. That was my job. Now, I didn't question that, and, and logic had nothing to do with it. But if we're getting into that side of it, each and every time that the prayers were done, the stone was put in place, we moved to the next one, the next one. Each one was linked up right across the globe, and then right at the end, we opened that doorway. Right at the end was a ceremony done in a very sacred area with the elders, and each one of those stones were sung up, and the doors were opened which is that grid of love and light upon the earth, to stabilize it, you know, to bring that new consciousness through. What Paul didn't tell you was he, um, Barbara Masiniak did a, a, a channeling session um, with him later, and um, she channels the, the Pleiadians, the, the reptilian Pleiadians, and they told Paul that he'd actually, he hadn't actually been gone for just a few hours, he'd been gone for weeks. And what they'd done was coded all this information into him while he was away. And that's why when he came back, it felt like he had been away for weeks and he actually, he literally had been away for weeks. And I recognised these places. I knew, I knew that they were there. And a lot of the t places that we went to, the elders actually recognised us. They said, you've been here before. You work with us. And we went, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So there was a, there was a point where they, they <laughs> there was there was see where you started <laughs> sorry there was a point where um, we had to surrender to it all and know that there's something much bigger running the show and that's when we could relax around it because yeah. we weren't doing it we were we were somebody said you're just the idiots to get out there and make it happen but you know behind the scenes there was a lot more going on. And so when we do, yeah, when we talk of the ancestors, it is. It is the beings from other planets. It is that connection to the stars that we all have. Um, John Trudell, a beautiful Native American activist and poet, talks about how you can't kill that. It's the genetic light from the other side that comes through over and over and over again to get the job done. And I think that's quite profound because we all have that memory, that coding <laughs> inside. And every time you go to a, an, uh, a sacred site, that genetic coding is fired off in you. That's why you get called to go to a place. If you're called to go to somewhere, go. Because your DNA is, is vibrating, it's, getting, it's wanting you, your ancestors are wanting you to fire off your DNA. 
They're wanting you to release the coding so that other people can get their coding as well. Lady yes. Sorry. That's oh, alright. <laughs> I do readings and some spiritual work and one of the most amazing experiences I had, I just went through my normal thing, not to do with anybody who's interested to find out how I go about things. It was a young Aboriginal woman, all this massive, incredible crystal aqua light came through. And I said to her, I feel like the absolute novice alongside her. She had no idea what I was talking about, but I was able to activate her memories. And oh, it's just such an amazing feeling. To yeah, do that. we've got amazing gifts. And what I'd like up here is as you go through, through each one, if you can tell us the planets, that would be wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so the, fir the first one, so that, that one's related to the Pleiadians. Some of these will resonate with some of you and others won't. Um, but whichever one resonates with you is, is it's firing off your coding. It's the same with the crop circles, the real ones. They're firing off some sort of coding within you. And so you remember, one of the things that the Pleiadians did with us when we were at a channeling a long, long time ago was they, they got us in a room, we were all very quiet, and then they went, remember. But they did it in a way that we all went, and for a few seconds we all remembered. And then it went away again. But, um, so the second one, the, the um, Tibetans. The Tibetans are interesting because they, have, they are actually connected to, there are so many different <coughs> species. So, way, <laughs> so many different um, connections. <coughs> they, um, they've got five, five different places that are, that are connected to the Tibetans. That's why there's, there's so much um, in their religions and whatever. If you go into all their religions, you'll find there's coding within all of them. Um, it's the same with all of our religions too. Underneath there is coding in there, but they've just taken it and used the coding to actually suppress us rather than allow us to be what we're supposed to be. But, um, so yeah, so the main people that, we, that we've learned that have come to the planet and the Pleiadians actually didn't change our DNA. They're the only ones who haven't um, fiddled with our DNA because they're our original parent. Um, but the Syrians have, the, um, the Orions oh, have, yeah. and the, the Draconians, is the Yes, yeah, the Draconians, yeah. That's where we can get our draconian law from. Um, that was the interesting thing too, was that, right? Yeah. Was that, you know, a long time ago when I started to look at where the dragon appeared and it just appeared everywhere and everything. You know, England doesn't have dragons, we don't have dragons, but it's in everything. Uh, when you look at rainbow serpent, that's different. Um, we, we have seen rainbow serpent. We've seen photos of rainbow serpent. And we know even in... Uh, when you're looking at the Peruvians and, and the the uh, Kero, with their knowledge, they have rainbow serpent, and it travels the same way. And it travels on the rainbow and goes from one place to the next. So these, they exist. They they are in the waterways, and that's why I was saying, I think to Alan, be careful when you go into water. Show respect to water. Let water know who you are, and ask permission before you go jumping in, because there are beings in there that that you want to respect because they will kill you. Rainbow serpent has no mercy if you do the wrong thing. You know, all of these things that they put down to myth and legend is not myth and legend, it is reality. You know, this is the whole thing. Oh, it's just your imagination or it's a story. It's not. This is, they don't make things up. You know, the creation story has been laid down over and over again. And when you, you talk about the Waitaha with their songs, it was all done in song. It's the same with the original people here. Their stories are not changed and not mucked around with and definitely not made up. So if you want to begin to open up, you know, you hear how, how Orion chased the Pleiades across the, the sky, the Seven Sisters and what happened with that, that's it. 
there's different versions. There's the children's story, and then there's the initiated male and, and female stories as well. But it's there. It's in all of it. So you don't have to scratch too far beneath the surface to begin to see what what is still there, what's still being laid down, what's kept safe. And when we travel with the with the Anunu in Central Australia, um, they show us what's actually written in the landscape um, that the ancestors actually put there so that they could find water, so that they could find food, so that they knew where the sacred sites were, so they knew when to ask permission to go into certain areas. Uh, so if you know what you're looking at, you know what you're looking at. That may sound really silly, but it is. When one, it's, it's like reading a book. You, you pick up a foreign language book, and until you learn the language, it doesn't make any sense. But eventually you'll start to see pattern and you'll start to see some sense being made of it. You know, there's one thing, and, and with respect for, for Western culture, when we go out and sit with the elders, we wait for them to tell us what they think that we need to know. Um, and often when we go out with, with Lee, there's a lot of briefing that's just like, sit and listen. Don't bombard them with questions because they'll clam up. Um, and when the time is right, they'll, they'll share. So we never, ever, ever, ever would go and, and say, what about this, what about this? And you'll say, oh, you know, he said, there's some photos I want you to see. He, he gave us photos of the rainbow serpent, and we still have those. He talked about when, just before we came out, how a, a light had appeared in the sky and a door had opened and, and, and he'd taken a photo of that. Um, so they share with you, but it's just a different way of learning because, you know, our mind is so questioning. We want answers to everything. But you get it by osmosis when you sit with them, and, and yeah. What was that? When, um, because the Dogon are originally from Egypt. They are the original Egyptians. Yeah, and then they were moved, they were shifted out of Egypt. And so we knew this, and we had a short period of time, we called it Egypt on steroids, and we landed in Cairo, and then the guys grabbed our passports and took our money, and we're going, what is going on? And next minute we're on this whirlwind tour of Egypt went all over the place and we went to the Great Pyramid. We had the green stone with us and Phoebe carried the stone. Um, we went into the Great Pyramid and there were queues and queues and queues of people to get in there. It was hot, it was sweaty, we were lining up. And then we got to the King's Chamber and there was no one in there. No one, no one to be seen anywhere. No one. So we, there was three of us, and then the phone rang, and we went, what's that all about? Better answer it. And <laughs> this is the king, the king's chamber. We're in the king's chamber, and we took the stone out, placed it against the granite walls, and we toned for, I don't know, it seemed like about two or three minutes. And incredible sound came from it, and that stone took on that resonance of, of that particular moment. When we finished, people came back into the chamber and it was all back on again. Um, the same thing happened in Cambodia when we got to these sacred falls to do a ceremony and it was a picnic spot for everybody. There was people everywhere and we're thinking, how are we going to do a ceremony? There's the sacred falls that we're going to put the stone in. Went down, put everything down, ready to do the ceremony, looked around, there was nobody there. They were all gone. <coughs> Just vanished. And we finished the ceremony, two Buddhist monks came down did a prayer at the waterfall before anyone else turned up. And, and then everyone else piled down with their lunches and their bits and pieces and we moved on from there. So when you're talking about, uh, I think most of us are working with guides and spirits and beings and that all of us are all the time. It's not anything new. Uh, and I think you'd be quite surprised how much they have a part in your life anyway off planet, on planet, you're all connected. It's, it's almost like you, well it is, you walk two worlds. You've got your foot in the in the day-to-day -day world where you pay your bills, you get things done, and you've got this whole other world that is connected to the stars, that's connected to your, to your ancestors, to your knowledge, to your knowing. You know that's really the real world, that you're living in a, you know, in a fake paradigm, really, that's keeping you locked down. And so it becomes very much a part of your life to a point where we don't even sort of stop and think too much now about who's working with us we just know we went when we did our journey we went up to to Mays Howe up to Orkney so right up the top of Scotland 
And again, you know, the reason I'm telling you some of these stories is because when you have faith and when you move with spirit, things happen. We got there, it was the biggest storm in 10 years. And we were grounded in Glasgow Airport, we couldn't get out. It was a little flight that we were taking from Glasgow to Orkney. And the next day we were able to fly. It was a huge storm and it was a big blizzard. We landed in the middle of it. We knew there were two parts to the ceremony that would occur. The first was in Mays Howe. Now Mays Howe in the winter solstice, which was when we were there, midwinter, is a, it's a, a cairn or a, a barrow. So it's a, a, an earthen mount with a long corridor straight through. Mid, midwinter, middle of um, the, the, summer, the winter solstice, the light comes straight down the very center. They've got a camera set up so you can see the shaft of light that goes down. I carved that stone in, in Lismore, in my shed, and I saw a vision. And the vision was that the stone would be illuminated by light when we went into May's house. We got there, there was just cloud and rain and snow, and it was just, just shocking. So I'm like, okay, well, we'll see what happens. We were staying in a place called Odin, which was right on the shores of the, of the salt water and a freshwater lake. Um, in another really ancient place, Loch. And I knew that the stone was to go into the freshwater lock. So there was a, there was a what do you call it, a causeway between the two. We went there and the guy just said to us, look, he said, there's no way you're going to see the light because it's just, I've never seen it like this. He said, seven years I've never seen that light come down through the, through the barrow, through the can. We got there and he showed us around. We're all disappointed. I brought my gear with me and the stone with me. And he was chatting away, chatting away, chatting away, and all of a sudden we just went, oh my God. And the light, straight down the shaft, all the way down. I took the stone and I did exactly what I saw, and just took it into the light and, and let the energy of, this, of the light come through. And everyone's jaw just dropped. He said, I could not believe that, that that would happen. We came out of there and we got a text from somebody in the, in the States because a friend of ours was from the States and she traveled with us. She said, are you guys okay? And we said, yeah, we're fine. She said, currently you're in the middle of a, the biggest storm in 10 years. You're in the eye of the storm and you're in the middle of an eclipse. Are you okay on the full moon? And so what happened was at the, in the afternoon, we got to Odin where we were staying right at the, at the edge of the lake and we did the final part of the ceremony was to cast that stone into the freshwater lock, we call it lock. <laughs> and we did and then we came home and I think two three weeks later we got an email from our friend said have a look at this and we went what and she said they just discovered a massive stone circle in the bottom of that lock that you put the stone in. Oh, yeah, which we, <laughs> this was incredible. We were we had decided to go to the Kurong camping in South Australia down on the on the coast, and a huge storm kicked up. We decided that we wouldn't. We would go to another place, which was on another portion of the coast. And uh, well, sort of we got blown around all over the place. Set up camp with some friends. Went down to the beach and looked out to sea. Huge. Yeah, the waves were huge. And there was one line, and I thought it was a, a fishing vessel. So it was just, it looked like, it sort of looked like it, but it was bobbing on the ocean, but it was a bit higher. But it wasn't actually bobbing, it was, it was yeah, just sitting there. Just sitting there. And then another one came and joined it, so then there was two. Then another one came in and joined it, and then they started doing Morse code. Yeah, they started connecting with each other. You could see the lights going from one to the other, just blinking at each other. And we said, oh, we're in for a visit. Yeah, so we turned around and left because we didn't like, we're, I'm like, no, we're no, not, not ready for this. They actually started to come in. Yeah. They picked up on our frequency and going, okay, they started to come in and went, oh, no, but they stopped. Yeah, and then we were all, we left it, forgot, not forgot about it, but we just thought, no, we're going to go to bed. All of us had our heads down, so there was six of us, and Phoebe and I were just getting into the car, and the friends were getting into the tent, and the next minute there's this almighty bang. And we looked up and it was just ozone pouring out of the sky. Everything went negative. Mm. It was like a negative. That can't gone straight over the top <laughs> of us. Straight over the top of us and said, let's scare the shit out. <laughs> <laughs> and we, <laughs> honestly, got, we're early risers, but we didn't get up till about 11, 12 o'clock the next day. It was just, we just huge. Move. 
trust your intuition implicitly. You know, it, it will never set you wrong at all. That that is our protection. Guys, you've been fabulous. Thank you so much. It's been so much fun. We really enjoyed it. I hope you have and I hope you've got something to take away with you. So thank you very much.